In Search of Common Ground, a conversation with Ron Week. Hi, Ron. Yes. Hey, it's Jeff. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? Hey, good. I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me. Oh, no, why not? This, especially after all the differences we've had over the years. Uh, yeah, but I have to admire you, you know. I mean, people who can change a position are worthy of respect. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I know I had, uh, like I've said to you before, I deserved every <coughs> tongue lashing I have ever got over some of this stuff because... Uh, I was pretty foolish to believe a lot of the stuff I believed, but I mean, I, 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 I think I've grown a bit, and I'm not as naive and foolish as That's I. That's the important thing. Look, we, you know, every everyone has uh, certain beliefs that they're not too proud of. I think I might have mentioned to you that in 1976, I got caught up in the news that the midget submarines were going to comb Loch Ness in search of the monster. <laughs> I thought, wow, wouldn't that be neat if they actually found a plesiosaurus? I mean, a live dinosaur, that would be something. And so, I, you know, I hung on to that through the summer of 1976, and, you know, I saw these grainy photos of what looked like a flipper, also looked like a piece of wood. Uh, but I gave him another chance in 1977 when they apparently had some more money to spend, and they went, searching the lock once again and yeah, they didn't find any monsters. <laughs> well, they're still looking for Nessie. I guess. At, at that point, I said, gee, I don't think I'm going to see a live dinosaur in my lifetime. It's too bad, but it ain't happening. Well, that must have been uh, before you became a uh, debunker extraordinaire for all these stupid conspiracies out there, I'd imagine, though. You know, um, it's like well, I've often called Mark Roberts the debunker extraordinaire. I don't consider myself a debunker extraordinaire. I I have a lifelong interest in weird beliefs. Mm -hmm. It uh, fascinates me to think that people will cling to something that does them no good. You know, in in the case of the 9/11 Truth Movement. I think Gage and, and Grifter are the only two people who actually turn a buck on it. Uh, I mean, you know, I've been exchanging emails with Jim Fetzer for years now, and, <laughs> you know, Jim is madder than a March hare, but there's something <laughs> oddly likable about him in his, in his sheer craziness. You know, as I said to him, he's like one of those classic English eccentrics uh, without whom the world would be poorer. But uh, does Jim Fetzer make any money off 9-11 conspiracies? Not that I can see. Uh, and I'm not following the guy around. But, you know, Grifter did sell books. And, uh, well, Gage finally figured out the way to go. I mean, Gage is flying first class. Uh, well, that's one thing I can't I can understand when it comes to that stuff. I mean, I, I have no problem calling, in my opinion, David Ray Griffin's a scoundrel and he's just a... He's just, he's just, uh, I, I don't know, he's knowingly out there uh, lying and making things up and d just the d disgusting things he talks about, the fake phone calls and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, Grif uh, Grifter's a bad man. Gage, for a time, I thought was nearly a fool, but... Um... He's not that much of a fool. I mean, there may be a part of them that believes the snake oil he sells, but um, I, I think he's pretty cynical. Well, I, I personally can't decide whether or not he believes what he's saying or not. If, does he actually believe what he's saying, or is he knowingly lying, like I think Griffin is? Well, in the case of Griffin, uh, he gives himself away. I, I ran him off an Air America show called Clout, when he was uh, talking about the m missing seat phones on uh, American Airlines 77. Oh, yeah, and his source for that was Rob Balsamo. Yeah, but see, the funny thing is this issue had come up between me and Griffin in an email exchange. So he knew at the time he went on the uh, the radio show hosted by, uh, what the hell was the guy's name, uh, Richard Green? Yeah. Green was his last name, but I can't remember. I think it was Richard Green. Uh, Griffin was on this radio show talking about the missing seat phones, and 
that was a year after Balsamo's nonsense was exposed. You know, I, I'm going to take a certain amount of credit uh, for, for the exposure. I contacted Gene Hotard, who at the time was the communications director of American Airlines, and I, I said, um, this guy David Ray Griffin is going around saying that there were no seat phones on the plane that hit the Pentagon. And Hotard expressed amazement at that. And I said, yeah, but there's a... He provides a clue. Uh, Griffin is careful to point out that there were no seat phones on any American Airlines domestic flights as of 2004. Now, why in a book devoted to the events of 9-11 is he talking about the absence of seat phones in 2004? Well, that led me led me to the truth. Uh, the seat phones were actually removed in 2002 and a few as late as 2003. American Airlines made the decision to remove seat phones from domestic flights in 2001. Mm-hmm. They didn't actually do any work on that till 2002. Hotard found out from me that no work order was ever issued for uh, Flight 77. So that nailed down the canard. I mean, the, the, the plane had seat phones. All American Airlines domestic flights had seat phones until 2002. But Griffin knew that when he was on, on being interviewed on cloud. So at that time, he was knowingly lying. He was knowingly lying. Mm. Now, Gage, you know, I'm not a mind reader. It's difficult to find that line, you know, that separates the outright lie from the untruth that the teller still holds dear, you know. Do they accept the fact that they're lying? They're clinging to this belief so desperately Part of them understands that it's not true, and yet I often think that they could take a lie detector test and pass it. Yeah, well, it seems like there's a certain thing where it seems like someone like, say, Griffin, for example, he it seems like he can't, he knows he's wrong, but he can't admit he's wrong because... He's. What's he gonna do? He's gonna have to take all his books and stuff off the shelves, or yeah, he's he's in too deeply, obviously. And uh, this now Gage apparently uh, apparently his wife left him. I mean, I keep hearing uh, that she left him over this nine eleven craziness. I don't know that as a fact. Uh, that's simply what I've heard. Yeah, maybe she left him for other reasons. Right. Well, yeah. Well, I've heard. You know. Uh, this. Uh, yeah. The same thing. I. I don't know. But I mean. Yeah. I, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's a rumor. It certainly strikes me as plausible. It could be true, but I don't know that. So it's not a point I would press. Uh, for example, in a public forum. Uh, finally, he released his his returns, and he is the only paid employee of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Now, I think he's got four other people who use up something like $32,000 in expenses. So I don't know if he actually has anyone answering phones. I know when I used to send an occasional email over there, I'd get a reply from some woman who was presumably a receptionist or secretary. But Gage took... Uh, 70000 in salary, and there was another 32000 that was dispersed for expenses. So, right, oh, I, I, was, I saw that on JREF. I saw yeah. the uh, that thread there. Uh, yeah, it was a fairly recent one. Yeah, yeah, I was reading through that one. But, uh, but like I said, I still, I, I don't know if Gage is sincere and really believes what he's saying. I, I still, I still can't say that he's knowingly lying. I, 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 well, one of the guys on the JREF, uh, I want to say it, it was Ben Birch, but I'm, I'm not sure. It might not have been him. He pointed out that when, when Gage jumped the shark with that uh, pizza box display in the debate with Mark Roberts, 
I don't know. That. Oh, that's the hard fire that I stepped aside for. Uh, we had to find Gage a truther host because, you know, he can't appear with me. I'm mean, you know. So I, I got him a host who's a truther. It didn't help him much against Roberts, but uh, he did wind up stacking pizza boxes up in a desperate attempt to form an analogy with a 110-story skyscraper. Oh, okay, I think. Oh, okay, I've I seen a picture of something like that. You see him madly piling up pizza boxes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I see. I yeah, seen, yeah, I seen those pictures floating around somewhere. Yeah. So here, here's what the poster pointed out. He said, "Now, Gage is not a layman. He was an architect. If an architect thinks that pizza boxes stacked up are analogous to a 110-story building, he is the single most incompetent architect alive." He should be stripped of his license. He should not be allowed to design a building. So the suspicion lurks that Gage is well aware of the fact that his analogy is ludicrous. And that would make him a liar. Well, I mean, it, you know, he's a fool or a liar. you got to pick one. <laughs> you know, you, you, can't, you can't escape unscathed here. He's either a total fool or he's a liar. Well, my my personal uh, point of view is that uh, I can't even argue that issue because who am I to know anything about structural engineering, building designs, or anything like that? But oh yeah, I mean I take that position myself. But on the other question, hand, I've I, been posing lately. I do listen to people who are structural engineers, and uh, you know I, I I listen to Mackie a lot because. Uh, Mackey has a very extensive background in physics and engineering. He didn't go the route to be a structural engineer, but as he points out to me, he said, look, I don't want to blow my own horn, but I'm certainly well qualified to discuss the forces acting on a building as it collapses. Right, but... You know, well, yeah, like, I mean, for, uh, you know, a handful of people that really, like, I mean, I don't know if an architect's uh, as qualified as an engineer or a structural engineer or anything to understand. Well, a structural engineer would say that the architect is not qualified, and the architect would say, well, you know, I actually uh, design the building. The structural engineer just makes sure that it doesn't fall down. Oh, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Well, my my problem is in, lately, and what I've been trying to get answers to is uh, when it comes to that issue is, you know, if I was uh, a scientist, say like Stephen Jones, uh, and I found nanothermetic materials, explosives in the dust, I'd be falling over backwards trying to get independent labs to verify my findings. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, why wouldn't they try and do this? Like that point I've made a thousand times. If I had evidence that contradicted the mainstream account of the events of 9-11 and I was persuaded of the validity of that evidence, I would do everything in my power to win a Pulitzer Prize. I'd want to see my mug on the cover of Time and Newsweek, you know, fame and fortune at my beckoning. I would seek out every mainstream scientist, engineer, demolition expert I possibly could, and I would confront them with my evidence. Now, the idea that you have this blockbuster evidence and all you can do is skulk in the bowels of the Internet? <laughs> it, it, uh, no, no, I'm afraid not. Yeah, it just uh, it, it it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't add up. But I mean, yeah, you, you choose to publish in some uh, uh, a, a, a paper play journal, and uh, you know the check clears, so they'll publish your article. And in the meantime, you wouldn't dream of submitting it to a serious technical journal. Well, what's going on here? But even people that agree, like that, don't buy into the thermetic materials or anything. They do say, okay, there is. Uh, flaws in the NIST report, but what can you expect? You're trying to, uh, you know, they're not going to... 
But that's besides the point. The fact of the matter is, is that I just rarely. Uh, oh, there's no, there's no. Uh, they're not making any effort to do anything. I mean, with the amount of money that's being taken in, I'm sure they could pay R.J. Lee the two thousand dollars to do testing, or anything, or anybody. Or I am trying to. I mean, this guy Chris Moore is working to get some lab lab tests done. I am trying to find out through Ross Carotis, who stepped down as the um, the head of the ASCII uh, journal, if it is possible to submit a paper to a technical journal that you have not written. In other words, would it be possible to submit Jones and Harris' paper to a material science journal? Oh, to see if it would be accepted? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't gotten the answer on that yet. Mm-hmm. But I, I did write, I was posting on the JREF under um, my my friend's handle, he called himself Fine Wine, and um, he got bored with conspiracies after a while, so I just sort of took it over from him, and I, you know, I let my friends know that I was, I was back. But... Um, Eventually, uh, they they caught on, and they made no effort to disguise my style. I essentially asked them to to catch me, and they, that account is suspended. You see, fine wine was never actually banned because they didn't prove that it was me. <laughs> that, but they were also in an awkward position in that a couple of the mods had been informed by me that I was doing it. So. Oh, so they were a stickler for the rules and had to suspend the account or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I knew that. I was, I was getting a little sick of posting anyway because at the time it was a horrible collection of nitwits there and really not much fun jousting. I, I mean, it's no better nowadays. You've got the marrow can and mirage memories and, you know, people who are just thoroughgoing imbeciles. <laughs> well, see, I've been thinking... I've been uh, thinking, like, in, in a way, debunkers and 9-11 conspiracy theorists, they spend endless amounts of time debating these nonsense issues. Um, but it doesn't seem like anybody's bothering with the cold, hard facts and evidence, I would say. Well... You're you're on the right track, uh, certainly. Um, One of my problems with the whole debunker versus truther issue is that uh, it gets mired in detail and uh, it, it misses the big picture. I mean, for example, a friend of mine who takes no interest at all in my debunking activities has said, Look, the first time I heard about these conspiracy theories, I heard that the the idea of the conspiracy was to go to war with Afghanistan and Iraq. So this all-powerful conspiracy with limitless, limitless resources at its disposal chooses to fabricate 19 hijackers, none of whom are Iraqis or Afghanis. It is really, I don't have to know any more than that. <laughs> you know, the whole house of cards just collapsed. You've got this, this vast conspiracy with limitless resources, and they don't want to make any of the hijackers an Iraqi or an Afghan. I mean, can you imagine these conspirators sitting around the table and they... You know, they're congratulating themselves on a good morning's work. You know, two buildings knocked down, the Pentagon hold, the walls hold and everything. And the one says, uh, you know, uh, in view of the fact that we did all this to start a war with Afghanistan, wouldn't it have been a good idea to make a couple of the hijackers Afghanis? And, you know, they all slap their foreheads and say, damn, why didn't we think of that? Yeah, but I'm confused as to, okay, if 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. Yeah. Okay, we went to Afghanistan, we went to Iraq. Why didn't we do anything concerning Saudi Arabia? Because it seems to me, from what I've been looking at and learning, that 
they're the Saudi Arabia in a way is the head of the snake when it comes to exporting terrorism. I agree with you. I, I agree. I mean, they are the Wahhabists, and uh, they are the uh, the country where most of the jihadists originate. Um, now, obviously, if you're going to strike back, if you're going to retaliate for the attacks on American soil, you have to go after the nation that is providing sanctuary for the terrorists. In other words, uh, the state sponsor of al-Qaeda was the Taliban. So they they must be your target. Uh, obviously, by limiting yourself to this clearly defined goal, you let the Saudis off the hook. And this has been a long-standing problem in American foreign policy. I mean, yes, Saudi oil is important to us, and uh, we permit them to take liberties that uh, I think make most Americans' uh, hair stand on end, you know. It's just like, how, how the hell can they do that? Uh, so I don't trust the Saudis. Uh, we're certainly finding out that Pakistan is not much of an ally, and Again, who who can be surprised by these developments? What I was really hoping to do was like in in being able to talk with you is to find like some common ground here. I think we have a fair amount of common ground. Uh, like I mean, like say take for instance, okay, Bob Graham and what he's been trying to say when it comes to the twenty eight redacted pages. Like I, I I understand that even Pat Curley supports the release of the twenty eight redacted pages. Like, would you support the release of those twenty eight redacted pages yourself? If I were satisfied that no elements of American security were going to be compromised, right? As long as no sources or methods would be compromised. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I certainly if if we if we have some sources on the ground at long last. Uh, I, I would not want uh, the cover to be blown. Oh, absolutely. If there was a name or something uh, that, you know, it could be blanked out or anything, that's fine. But... I mean, I'm, I'm no fan of, of the CIA. The CIA has done nutty things and pointless things. I mean, one thinks of MK Ultra, for example. And, uh, you know, so obviously these are people who need to be reined in from time to time, and they, they certainly uh, they have to be scrutinized. But you can't hamstring these intelligence agencies to the degree that the Church Committee did in 1976 uh, because you no longer get usable intelligence. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah, the intelligence would dry up. Yeah, to, to get intel, you have to deal with some pretty nasty people sometimes. And if you're going to make it a standing rule that you, you can only deal with the morally pure, well, you, you may as well fold up your tent because you're not going to produce any intel. You know, I mean, spying is a dirty business. Right, right, yeah. But you, you have to strike some kind of balance between allowing the agency to function and curbing its instincts for excess. Well, because like, I remember, I, I, I got a quote here from uh, CBS News with uh, Bush talking about how the reason why he didn't want those 28 pages uh, released was because he didn't want to compromise the investigation. And that okay, was... Well, again, I, it, since we don't know what's on those 28 pages, it's hard to make an assessment. Well, do you don't do you think that Bob Graham uh, has basically he's made it pretty clear what's involved in those twenty eight pages? It's basically it's the it's the involvement in uh, the financing of the Saudis. Well, look, I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Posner wrote a book, Why America Slept, and he went, went in great detail into the sources of, of financing for these terrorist cells and. Uh, I live here in New York City. There were several cells operating in Brooklyn. Right, right, yeah. And then I uh -huh. guess there, basically there would have been no 
Al Qaeda or anything without the golden chain, etc. No, no, of course not. I mean, this is one of the ugliest and most open secrets of our time. That money is flowing to terrorist groups in the Middle East from the United States and Western Europe. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I, I have to laugh when these truthers talk about the uh, the five Israeli students. You know. Well, of course it's possible that they may have been working for the Mossad. The Mossad is monitoring closely Islamist cells in northern New Jersey and in New York City. Oh, absolutely. And and Israel was one of the places that gave us warnings. Um, well, they weren't really actionable warnings, but, you know, there, there's a sense that some people knew that a, a major attack was in the works. I mean, I was indignant at Bush when 9-11 happened because uh, I thought that Clinton was feckless on matters of national security, and I felt that Al Gore would do no better. So I thought Bush would likely do a better job of protecting America. So from January 20th, when he was inaugurated, till September 11th is uh, almost nine months what the hell, we had this massive attack on American soil. You know, I would have been furious if Al Gore were at the helm, and here I have the guy I voted for at the helm. I mean, how did this happen? You know, why, why, did, why did we elect a tough-on-the-terrorist, uh, pro-military Republican president if what he gave us is nothing better than a liberal Democrat would have given us? You know, I mean, okay, I think Bush to a certain degree redeemed himself in the aftermath of 9-11, but uh, he deserves no praise at all for the run-up to 9-11. Okay, like, from all the warnings and all the information that uh, Bush had, I mean, you know, when 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 he, he's quoted as saying, you know, I, I thought, wow, what a terrible pilot. Um, and then the second plane hits... I mean, well, yeah, I mean, look, my, my girlfriend woke me up and said a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. And I, my first question coming out of my sleep was, well, what what do they think happened? Do they think it was an accident or is it a terrorist attack? And in a matter of a, literally a couple of minutes, we learned that the second plane crashed. And I, at that point, of course, you know, it's a terrorist attack. You, kind of eliminated the possibility of an accident. You know, now you know that the country is under attack. But uh, once again, at that moment, two planes have hit in New York City. My, my first thought was, what's next? What's going to happen now? How, how many planes are going to fly into buildings? Is it going to be 10, 15, 20? You know, what's going on? And then, you know, the Pentagon was hit, and uh, the fourth plane was presumably headed for the Capitol. Uh, that's a, I don't want to stray too far from the subject at hand here, but one of my great beefs with truthers is that they say things that they can't possibly have considered. You know, it's like they blurt it out, and you ask them, did, did you think that through at all? I remember one guy raving about Larry Silverstein calling his insurance company before Building 7 collapsed. And I said, let, let me understand this. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find a point here for you. Do, do you think it was inappropriate for the building owner to call his insurance company when the fire department is telling him that the building faces imminent collapse? I know I'd be on the phone with my insurance company. Is Who wouldn't? Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. Who wouldn't? So they say Larry Silverstein was calling his insurance company. Isn't that suspicious? And I ask myself, suspicious of what? If he didn't call his insurance company, yeah, that would be damn suspicious. My question was, uh, how come he doesn't want to know exactly where he stands here? You know, I'd be calling the insurance company and asking several questions. For example, uh, 
suppose the building doesn't collapse completely and we still have a large shell. How does that affect my coverage if that shell has to be brought down? I mean, this issue, of course, arose with the Deutsche Bank. But, uh, yeah, there would be a lot of questions you would have for your insurer if you were told that your building is facing collapse. Mm -hmm. So for someone to suggest that it's unusual that he would call the insurance company, I I can only shake my head in wonderment. Under what circumstances would you not contact your insurance company? Well, that's like, uh, that reminds me of that one quote there from uh, that guy. Um, If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers, right? Well, sure, but, uh, I I mean, I I can safely say that if I were the owner of a building that's burning... Well, I don't mean Silverstein, I mean truthers. Like, it seems like truthers, uh, or I don't even, I can't even use the word truther anymore because they're not interested in the truth. They're conspiracy theorists. Yeah. They're not interested in the truth. They're they're so uh, preoccupied with all this nonsense that they're not... Like I mean, even when you, when it comes to the stand down or shoot down or what is it? They, they say that Cheney ordered a stand down, yet they think that uh, Flight 93 was shot down. So which is it? Was it? You, you, you and I, you oh. know, we're, we're like some kind of two headed beast because I'm going through this on uh, what's the name of the video here? Uh, it's called How to Destroy a 911 Truther, <laughs> and there's a nut named Sidionian. He's an Austra- Australian or something. I never heard of that one. kind of breakdown today. He just spammed the same nonsense over and over and over and over. For example, he keeps asking me, "Let's let me open up one of his spammed comments." They were all flagged <laughs> as spam. So let's see. Okay, I think this should be. Oh, someone else is actually on here. You know it. it I feel like I'm a fool. So it's it's fun while I'm doing it, and then I say to myself, you know, there's probably like three people on this line. Who the hell am I talking to? I mean, I I think it's important to 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 correct the misinformation or disinformation or, or call them even lies. I mean, it, I, I think if it wasn't for both sides, I mean, so, and you know, somewhere in the middle might lie the truth. Um, it's important to correct the historical record, if not just for the purpose of having a correct historical record of the events. Now, he has asked this, without exaggeration, 30 times. He writes, stop making excuses and quoting experts. Show the Pentagon footage or shut up. Stop making excuses and quoting expert. Explain Russo's slash Minetta's testimony or shut up. Explain the fake suicides by 9-11 witnesses. Explain NIST, FEMA, debunked pseudoscience and refusal to debate. And so I keep writing, the Pentagon footage cannot show the image of a plane moving 750 feet per second. Security cameras, to save money, are set at too slow a shutter speed to catch an object moving that fast. They're not there to catch an object moving 750 feet per second. That's not why you have security cameras. Oh, yeah, exactly. And security cameras are even worse than the the video equipment that was uh, used to capture the the, the planes into the World Trade Center. And that's why sometimes it looks, you know, like it's melding into the building. It's frame blending. It's inter... Uh, video interpolation, like it's it's it. It's, this is not high quality video. Now, I'll tell you the truth. When he says explain Russo's testimony, I, he's referring to Aaron Russo. Oh, Aaron Russo. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I I I don't. What do you know about Russo's testimony? Did of he, what concerning the Pentagon? Or did Russo speak to the 9/11 Commission? And if so, why why would he? Who would? I mean, where would Aaron Russo enter the picture? I I I that I have that. I don't know anything about it. Makes no it. sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I googled it and found nothing. I ha- I'm having some fun with this guy, Aaron Russo. Before he died, conducted an interview with a guy named Nicholas Rockefeller, and I thought Nicholas Rockefeller—that name doesn't ring a bell. Of course, I don't profess to be an expert on the 
Rockefeller family. But then I noticed on a prison planet discussion forum that even over there, people were saying, by the way, does anyone have any info on Nick Rockefeller? Does anyone know exactly where he fits in the Rockefeller family tree? Well, I finally tracked down an extensive Rockefeller family tree on the, in a Wikipedia article. There's no Nicholas Rockefeller there. I mean, that could be the guy's real name. He could have changed it to Rockefeller, but I'm at this juncture fairly confident in stating that he is not related to the Rockefeller, you know, and he, he's just not. The reason nobody's ever heard of him and he's such a shadowy figure is that he doesn't appear to have any connection with the Rockefeller family. So, of course, the interview between him, where he's revealing all the secrets of 9-11, and Aaron Russo, uh, doesn't figure to be terribly illuminated. Yeah, I don't know. Like that, the whole uh, if the people that think that no plane hit the Pentagon, I, I can't see how. I don't know. It's just so stupid. But I mean, and and the whole thing about, like I said, like they say, Cheney conducting a stand down order. Um, it's just uh, it, it, is it a shoot down order or is it a stand down order? Because if he if he conducted a stand down order of the air defenses that day, then. How did they? How do they think that Flight 93 was shot down? Well, it doesn't make this sense. This is the point that I, I keep asking them about. I said, well, if you want to insist that the UA 93 was shot down, that puts paid to your claim of a stand down, right? But but truthers always want to have it both ways. But there. But do you think that there is a significant issue when it comes to the whole shoot down orders? Like, I mean. Okay, we know now that uh, uh, the sh- a shoot down order from Cheney was communicated to Needs uh, yeah. at ten thirty one that morning, but yeah. they couldn't, they did not follow that order, and they knew that they could not follow that order because Cheney is not in the chain of command to issue that order. Well, at the point where uh, now, Cheney was, had the conversation with the military aid, can be though. Why didn't Bush or Rumsfeld, the two guys that could issue the shoot-down order, how come neither one of those guys issued a shoot-down order? Didn't the shoot-down order from Bush come to Cheney while he was in the bunker? I believe that Cheney had that before 1030, but not in time but what, to but shoot the, down UA-93. But wouldn't the question be, why would Bush give a shoot-down order through Cheney. Because well, Bush he, wasn't in Washington. But he had Bush had his military aid there. He could have gave it to him, or he could have issued it himself, or Rumsfeld could have. But instead, Rumsfeld sitting in his office, not answering the phone, getting, briefed, getting a CIA briefing, um, and Bush, he, he, him and Cheney talk, but, they, but when they talk that morning... They talk about what Bush is going to say in his address to the nation. And then when Cheney, or, or sorry, when, when Bush and Rumsfeld spoke to each other, and this the 9-11 Commission asked because they know that, that no shoot-down order was, was, was given by these guys and they want to know. It says in the 9-11 Commission report, the president apparently spoke to Secretary Rumsfeld for the first time that morning, shortly after 10. No one can recall the content of this conversation, but it was a brief call in which the subject of shoot-down authority was not discussed. So they, the two guys that have the power to issue the shoot-down order, neither one of them did. And until this day, we're st- we're it's <laughs> we're still waiting for those orders. I guess. Well, <laughs> I mean, I know that that Bush communicated the shoot down order to Cheney around ten. Why would he communicate it to Cheney? Because he could, Cheney can't issue that order, and the, the military wouldn't follow it. And as we see, the military didn't follow Cheney's shoot down order. Well, well, there was nothing to shoot down. At that point, remember, uh, Minetta's timeline is off by over half an hour. So when when 
Well, as far as the timeline goes, neither the truthers, as far as I understand it, neither the truthers nor the debunkers know when Cheney got to the PEOC and uh, the whole thing with Mineta. The 9-11 Commission report does not know. They don't know what the time is. So on both sides cannot be sure of either one. If that makes now, the crash occurs at 10.03. Now, at that point, the aide has asked Cheney, does the order still stand? Now, Cheney has gotten the order from Bush, I said, slightly before 10, which must be the case. The thing to keep in mind here is that when... They're talking about a plane being 30 miles out, 20 miles out, 10 miles out. They're not tracking a plane. They're looking at a projected flight path, not for AA-77, but for UA-93. What nobody knows is that that plane's already on the ground. That plane's not in the air anymore. It's not approaching anything. It's down. The, 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 The immediate confusion when this uh, conversation between Cheney and the military aide was first brought to light, Mm -hmm. were they talking about Flight 77 that hit the Pentagon or 93 that was brought down by the uh, the passengers? Mm -hmm. They had to be talking about 93 because they had a projected flight path at their disposal. And they felt that the plane was aiming at a target in Washington, D.C., which certainly makes sense. It was probably aiming at the Capitol building because they want a big target that they can hit. The White House would be a poor choice of a target because the guys are not great flyers and they might not destroy the White House, you know, but they can fly a plane into the Capitol building. You know, you can't. Well, that's that's another thing I just don't understand is how. Uh, some people think that it, they were talking about Flight 93 when Minetta, like uh, Lee Hamilton asked Minetta, when we're talking about Flight 77, he says yes, and then uh, some other people talked to him years later, they talked to Minetta, and they confirmed that it was in regards to 77, and then yeah. I, even, I talked to Minetta myself, and he confirmed again that it was concerning Flight 77. Yeah, apparently that's what he thought. Uh, I, I spoke uh, quite a bit to Chris Kojum, who is the senior counsel for the 9-11 Commission. Mm-hmm. And uh, while he was helpful to me in terms of resolving questions that I had, you know, he explained, no, he would not come on hard fire. and He, he, he really doesn't want his remarks attributed. But the impression that he gave me, I said flatly, is Minetta a little bit senile? And and his comment was, well, those are your words. <laughs> now, <laughs> you know, make of that what you will. But uh, I, I I said, you know, the the painful thing watching Minetta getting ambushed by some truth, or I don't know, maybe it was you. No, no, that was uh, you. You're talking about a video where they're talking to him. Yeah, Minetta is blissfully unaware that he is at the center of a swirling controversy. He does not know that he is part of any kind of controversy. He's just standing by his story. And Kojim said to me, he said, look, why didn't we put Minetta in the book? Well, his account was so thoroughly disproved by telephone logs and by all the other people there, it was discredited. You know, if you want to read Minetta's uh, account, his testimony, yeah, go ahead, do it. You can find it easily enough on the Internet. But they didn't put it in the book because they felt that the book's purpose was to answer questions raised by victims' families. And Minetta's account was simply wrong. He's he's off by more than a half an hour. Incidentally, Mike Williams of 911myths.com has a very, very good discussion of Minetta. Mm-hmm. He's got a few pages on it now. And, and well, I, I found it strange, like, uh, when I when I did talk to him and I had mentioned uh, Douglas Cochran's name, that's, he basically had hung up on me. <laughs> um, like, 
and and Cochran did say he remembered Minetta. See, I don't well, know <laughs> how how out of it Minetta. Well, right now apparently he's not in good shape, but uh, back in two thousand and one, I don't know to what extent he had his wits about him. Mm-hmm. Because it was pointed out to him that you know you're you're saying things, you're quoting people, and a bunch of other people remember these quotes. So you got that part right, but they all remember it happening at least a half hour after you say it happened. And then you've got the telephone logs where Minetta is saying something happened at, say, 916, and the telephone log proves that it happened at 948. Now, for some reason, Minetta seems impervious to correction. He's just one of these people who, when when he makes a statement, that's it. That's his statement. He stands by it. Mm -hmm. But I would recommend uh, taking a look at 911myths.com. You might have to go to the old pages. You see, Mike Williams is revamping the whole site. So when you go to it now, you'll be on the new pages. And he says there's a link that you can click on at the bottom if you want to go back in time. Mm Mm-hmm. Come to think of it, I think the Minetta the Minetta information is on the new is on the new site. But uh, Mike has has been as interested in Minetta's testimony as I have been, mm-hmm. and I I reveal some of the stuff Chris Cogent told me, and uh, I, again Cogent does not want to be quoted, so I've never quoted him. Well, we could find out like a, a lot of the information. Um... If we had the, you know, Cochrane's testimony released, because they talk about all that in in his questioning. Yeah, let me just see now. If I if I go to, uh, I don't want to waste any of your time steering you. No, like I said, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Yeah, no problem. Let's see now. But would you like also? Would you support the release of the the inf- like uh, Cochrane's? Uh, if I were satisfied that it's not going to compromise sources and methods, yeah, yeah. I, 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 as long as nothing bad is going to happen to America as a result of it, right? Like, yeah, and I, I want you to know, like, I, I want to tell you, like, I. The reason why, like, I mean, everything I did was with the best of intentions. Like I, like I said, I was fooled, okay, and I trusted the wrong people. And I thought, I never thought these people would turn out to be the lying scoundrels that they were. And they, they did influence me quite a bit and, you know, whispered in my ear and stuff and got me to believe a lot of stupid things. Like, I, I love America, and I don't want to see America fall. And See, that's, a, that's an excellent point you're raising here, because I've, I've said this on various occasions. I've said it on the air a few times. It's one thing I can't quite get my mind around. If I thought that 9-11 were an inside job, why wouldn't I want the criminals to be brought to justice? That's, that's the part that I don't understand. It's, it's like these, these truthers will say, well, you want to protect Bush. And my response is, why? Well, I mean, what, what has Bush ever done for me? Well, the way I kind of looked at it in a way was like... put a dime in my pocket. Why would I want to protect him if I thought he was guilty of a crime? Well, it seems like from every indication that he's covering up for the Saudis. It's not so much covering up because... There isn't much to cover up. Everybody knows that the Saudis play both ends of the street. Like, the Saudis might be Bush's friends, but they're not friends to America. Not at all. Not at all. Eh, They're not Bush's friends, you know. I mean, they they try to peddle influence. Now, this is on the new page. If if you want me to, I'll just send you a link Mm -hmm. to the Manetta discussion because Wow, Mike has expanded his coverage considerably since the last time I was here. I was hoping to get a hold of him, too, to ask him if he would uh, support the release of the 28 pages. Because, like I said, I want to find common ground. Like I said, I don't like the whole nine, what 9-11 truth has become, and, and it disgusts me. I just I want the truth. 
and I want the historical record to be correct. That's uh, a worthy goal. What the hell? What, what is this? this? This guy keeps raving about my list. Well, you're gonna, I'm sure you've attracted a lot of the freaks just as much as I have that uh, just come and spam you. And uh, yeah, one, one guy was telling me I'm fat and balding. And I'm thinking to myself, um, I don't think I'm balding. I mean, <laughs> maybe I've gained a few pounds. I mean, I'm I'm six two and a quarter and a hundred and ninety six pounds. Now I don't know. It doesn't doesn't make me felt. Well, then I'm fatter than you because I weigh more than you. (laughs) Jesus, I mean, you know, yeah, when I was working out a lot, when I was a young guy, I was the same height and 182 pounds. (laughs) And uh, I frankly think I looked better than I do now. That's when you were hanging out with the Playboy girls? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love to tease truthers about that. Oh, I don't know. I'm very childish. It's the truth. (laughs) What about uh, Abu Stadr Sheikh? Are you uh, familiar with him? Mm, doesn't ring a bell. The inform the San Diego informant that was ha- that had uh, Al Al Hazmi and Al Midar uh, living with him. No. No. Well, he was uh, he was uh, he was supposed to be an FBI. Inf- he was an FBI informant. Oh, this is this is wonderful. Philo Polymath has posted a comment on your profile, and the comment reads, Nimen do shi hun bun dan ne galeo shi hai shi sa huang. And then there's the name Walter Russell, shi igi. <laughs> sending me comments in Chinese. It's fabulous. You're going to have to use Google Translator for that one unless you uh, learn Chinese through the Rosetta Stone or something. I think I might just pass. <laughs> But the the, the Abu Stadr Sheikh uh, situation, like that whole uh, scenario, that's pretty uh, interesting. Like, did you know when uh, the Joint Inquiry uh, they tried to talk to him? And uh, oh, I just sent you the link, by the way, to Mike Williams. Okay, thanks. But he he he. Uh, like, see, this is okay. I don't care whether Bush was Republican, Democrat, or whatever. I'm not picking on Bush because for some reason it's Bush or something like that. It's just I wouldn't care who it was that was president at the time. And it's not like I'm trying to find ways to, uh, you know, talk bad about Bush. You know, honestly, the guy seems like a pretty good guy, you know, like, uh, it, it, like you know, like he seems like if you were to talk to him and stuff, he's a pretty nice guy, he's a funny guy and stuff exactly. like that. He has hungry, decent whatever. instinct. Uh, he is uh, very slow to adjust to developments. In other words, he, he hung on to a failed strategy in Iraq past the point when it should have been clear to him that a new approach was required. You know, I mean, yeah, they turned it around in 2007, but my God, for three years, people were telling him, you know, the outlook isn't rosy. Things are not going as well as they should be. Now, well, when 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 Graham was conducting the the Senate investig the joint in- inquiry, um, they got on to uh, Abu Sadr Sheikh. He was an informant in San Diego, and uh, he had an FBI handler that was down there. And uh, basically, when when the joint inquiry tried to talk to him. He didn't. He wouldn't talk to him. Bush stopped uh, the joint inquiry from talking to him, and then basically uh, they they paid this informant that was housing Al Midar and Al Hamzi a hundred thousand dollars. Like I don't understand why, but uh, they gave him money, and uh, he never had to testify. And but. The 9/11 Commission did get to talk to him, but when at, at the very crucial time when he was he was he was connected to Al Midar Al Hamzi by and the two Saudi uh, agents Bayoumi and Bassan, they were all in kind of they all knew each other and everything. Yeah. And Abu Stadr basically wouldn't testify. He refused to testify to the joint inquiry, and uh, Bush basically told him. He didn't have to testify. He wasn't going to testify, and they 
they, whoever, taxpayer money, $100,000 of taxpayer money was paid to a guy that was housing two of the hijackers with connections to the two Saudi agents, Bayoumi and Bassan. Do you, do you have any of this uh, uh, material available to send to me? Oh, absolutely. It's 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 in the uh, it's in the uh, joint inquiry report. It's, uh, I have a quote right here. It says the administration yeah, has let me take a look at that. The, the administration has to date objected to the inquiry's efforts to interview the informant in order to attempt to resolve those inconsistencies. The administration would also not agree to allow the FBI to serve a committee subpoena and deposition notice on the informant. Instead, written interrogatories from the joint inquiry were, at the suggestion of the FBI, provided to the informant through an attorney. The informant has declined to respond to those interrogatories and has indicated that if subpoenaed, the informant would request a grant of immunity prior to testifying. It goes on further to say that he was not, Bush was not, he would, he, he said he didn't have to testify, would not t- testify, and then the informant was paid a hundred thousand dollars. Like I talked to the FBI handler that was handling him, and he's pissed off, and so was Bob Graham. I talked to Bob Graham too, and I told Bob Graham that that uh, he was allowed to talk to the 9/11 Commission, and he was kind of pissed off when he heard that because he what they weren't allowed to talk to him. But this guy plays a key role. Fox News, when they put that last, the secrets to 9-11, they talk about Abu Stadter. They talk about that. Man, it's, it's weird. But that whole situation is weird. And why, why that informant, after he was housing two of the hijackers and, had, and knew Bassan and Bayoumi, by, Bayoumi, told, Bayoumi was the one who introduced uh, Al, Al-Hazmi and Al-Midar to Abu Stadter, and they ended up going and living at his house, but Abu Stadter says, no, no, they, they came to live at my house because they saw, uh, they saw rooms for rent at a mosque or something, and that's all lies. And then when I talked to the FBI guy that was, uh, that was his handler, the, Mr. Uh, Butler there, like he's, uh, I don't know, he, you know he's, he's pissed off too because he said, like, have you seen the whole thing with the secrecy kills and the whole how the uh, CIA kept uh, the information about uh, Al-Midar and uh, Al-Hazmi from the FBI. Oh, but that, I mean, that's the biggest scandal of the whole, um, the run-up to 9-11, the attacks themselves, and even the, uh, the investigation that followed. The wall separating the CIA from the FBI. I mean, this is something, by the way, conservatives were screaming about for years before the 9-11 attacks happened. I mean, there were people who... Yeah, but it was it, it was deliberate with prophetic. Like, on this. like they, there was a memo sent out in the CIA saying that they had forwarded this information to the FBI, and the person that sent that out knew that they didn't send the information to the FBI, so they deliberately lied. So they were keeping the FBI in the dark about. This. Yes, there, there is a, a bitterness and a rivalry between the two agencies, and, and of course, this is another thing that. But like, he basically laughed when when you hear about he he told me if I would have had that information from the CIA about Al Hazmi Al Midar I could have at least stopped the Pentagon plane or he could have broken up that cell because he he the, the 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 guy his informant was housing two of the hijackers <laughs> like it's crazy no I uh, see I I'm of the opinion that there is a, a 9/11 story that remains to be told that people in Washington were covering their asses and everyone knew they had done a truly bad job. And the fingers started to point and everyone points at someone else. Mm -hmm. But uh, the FBI and the CIA have to bear a great deal of the blame for those attacks. Well, I I think that it was a load off uh, the the FBI... uh the the agents uh a load off his shoulders when he realized like I, in a way he probably always thought like geez if i just knew about if the if if i just knew i could have stopped it well it's not you know it's in a way he finds something out like now that. i sent him the information yeah something like, like that would not my you. fault these guys deliberately withheld this information from me if they just would have passed it on like they were like they said they did yeah but they didn't want the rival agency to get any credit <laughs> Well, what about Richard Clark's whole thing where he was saying, like, he makes, 
you know, he he's kind of upset too, I guess, eh? Yeah, I, I think uh, that we can safely say that. He gives the benefit of the doubt. Like, what's he supposed to say? He's like, okay, well, maybe, you know, I think maybe they were trying to recruit them as agents. But uh, uh, they had already known yeah. that they weren't going to be agents. Exactly. This is a year and a half later. Like, how long are they going to try and recruit them as agents? And then you have Anthony Schaefer pin, you know, uh, he 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 identifies three three different cells in America, and uh, his his boss Rod Eisler kind of shuts him down on that. Like I mean, between Anthony Schaefer and uh, Mr. Butler, they could have they could have stopped the whole nine eleven plot. You you probably heard that there was some sporadic cheering in the streets of New York when the towers came down. Now I can tell you one of the places where people did take to the streets and cheer. It was in a part of Brooklyn, right along at the, the, the juncture of Flatbush and Atlantic Avenues. I, my girlfriend at the time lived all oh, about a mile from there. It's heavily populated by Arabs. You know, there's all sorts of stores, markets with Arab, Arab lettering, and they they were just delighted as hell when the Twin Towers came down. Mm-hmm. You know, now what do you do with people who are cheering the deaths of almost three thousand civilians? What do you do with them? I think you uh, you, you know where they live. You know where they are. Well, I think you toss them out of the country, at le- or you put them in jail or toss them out of the country. You know, if they're here legally, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is. Uh, okay, the argument is, well, they, you know, they don't like America much, and they were very pleased, but on the other hand, they didn't actually participate in the attack. I can tell you that in 1941, and I think you'll have no, no difficulty agreeing with me, that any American who expressed enthusiasm for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor would have uh, you know, faced a difficult and uncertain future. Well, yeah, it's just uh, that's I guess it's uh, what can you, you're supposed to be a free country and people that's, are, that's are the idea. That allowed to express really say me. anything you like. Now you can't actually throw a bomb into someone's store, but if someone else throws the bomb, you can cheer and say, "Good, they got that bastard." No, no. that doesn't make you a good person. But on the other hand, you do not run afoul of the law. Well, I got a question for you, Ron. Like hypothetically, in a way, like for, from like the stuff about the informant. Like, if if you were president, would you think questioning an FBI informant who was housing some of the nine eleven hijackers would be a good idea? <laughs> I kind of think it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd like to know more. So, therefore, why would Bush stop the joint inquiry from questioning this guy, man? Well, why would they give him $100,000 probably of taxpayer you, money? you got to check all the sources. Who says it was Bush who stopped it? This, this, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the links. I'll yeah. give you, this is in public records. Like, I mean, I know how you don't, uh, you know, you and uh, James Dorman uh, had a few uh, words on the uh, 9-11 Oz forum there. But I got to tell you, like, the stuff that he writes, like, this guy, he loves his country. He joined the military, you know, because he loves his country. And he wanted to go and <laughs> he wanted to go and kill all the bad guys, too. But then he realized that we weren't told the truth. And this guy puts out some very good, very good source. That he doesn't make up conspiracy theories. Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly like to see the material, but... Mm. Uh, they and even I, like say Anthony Summers and Robin Swan, like I mean, they're I think like do, would you agree? Did you get a chance to read their book or anything? I I don't have the Summers' new book. No, uh, like James told me that that was the best book he's ever read on uh, 9/11. Well, I haven't been out much in the last two weeks because uh, I've had the sinus the, the sinus infection. <laughs> yeah, uh, it really done a number on me. Yeah. But but yeah, like I mean, if yeah, you're I, I will, yeah. you you would you would want to question this FBI informant, no? Why not? Mm-hmm. Like, did you weren't aware of all this stuff? Like, well, look, uh, I think everybody has the idea that there's more to the Saudi involvement than we've been told. Mm-hmm. 
uh, again, the, the existence of Islamist cells in the New York City metropolitan area is an ongoing source of concern for me. I mean, these people are still there. You know, people who were cheering when the towers came down, they, they still live in Brooklyn. They're still in the same shops, same same neighborhood. Uh, this can't be good. I don't see any possible, any outcome that I can approve of as a result of uh, harboring this sort of enemy in, in the midst. Like, do you would you would it be too much for me to say that uh, the CIA was lying to cover for the hijackers? Well, why would they cover knowingly, for the like hijackers? knowingly, knowingly they they they? I mean, the CIA it's 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 a bizarre organization. It it zigs and it zags. I mean, the truthers have this rather simplistic view that it's a monolithic organization, and and they came up with the zany idea that the CIA was subservient to Bush. Now, uh, I mean, truth is tend to be divorced from reality, but it's apparent to any thinking person that the CIA relished undercutting Bush. I mean, they, it seems they never missed a chance to make Bush look like a fool. Well, Bush, like, he seems to have the... He seems to be... well. Covering it, it that, when you look at all this real information, not conspiracy theory stuff, it looks like there's a deliberate cover up to to uh, that shows Saudi involvement. That Senator Graham and even Republican Shelby <laughs> said that should be released to the public. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it's if, if you're casting about for plausible motives, well. Let's see. Bush secured the cooperation of the Saudi intel. They dragged their heels, but by February of 2002, they officially acknowledged that, yes, America did name the hijackers correctly. As you recall, the Saudis refused to do that. <laughs> even, even after we started the war in Afghanistan, they were saying, we're conducting our own investigation. We're not relying on the Americans' findings. We don't yet accept the idea that 15 of these hijackers were Saudis. Oh, the, and one of those Saudis said this is all an elaborate uh, yeah. eye by Israel or something. Five months later, five months after the attack, the Saudi intelligence acknowledged that, yeah, yeah, the Americans got it right. Yeah, they, they, they did get the right name. Well, we got we got Bandar on on video admitting that they were following the hijackers with precision, but the, we got we got warnings from all over the place, including Israel. For anybody that but once wants, again, though, the Israelis will acknowledge that they warned America, but right? They but we never received claim to have ever provided actionable intelligence. The two places we never received any warnings from was Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, we're, we're certainly finding out a lot more about Pakistan. Than, well, we're finding out a lot that many of us have suspected for a long time. And even here, uh, okay, the Pakistanis are double dealers, but any Pakistani government that was overtly pro-American faces a coup. You know, you know I mean, these people... They have their own lives and their own politics, and if they're going to tilt heavily in favor of American uh, America, they're going to lose popular support. So if you're a yeah, Saudi, we have like you know, walk a very fine line. I mean, you you want to keep America pouring some money in, and you don't want to be ousted by force, you know. So what do you do? Oh, it's um. Well, it almost seems like. Uh... Al Qaeda is like Bush or Bandar's attack dogs, and Bush and Bandar are like, like buddy buddy. I mean, when when the whole BAE scandal was going on, Bandar threatened uh, Britain to, that they'd get terrorist attacks if they didn't stop the investigation in the BAE scandal. Like, I mean, like, I, I mean, is there an easy answer? No, there isn't. I think. And I hope that I'm right. I 
I believe that the pot isn't boiling quite so vigorously in the Middle East these days. Call it the Arab Spring, call it whatever you like. I would certainly give a certain amount of credit to the uh, new Iraqi government, but it just seems to me that their tempers are not running quite so high in the Middle East right now. Like they don't want to kill all the infidels over here in North America? Right, right. And I, I think that they did get the idea that this terrorist attack against America did them more harm than good. In other words, yes, they, they scored a tremendous initial victory, but... Um, well, we were like, how Michael Schauer was saying how uh, it was to entice the Americans to come and fight over there, and then we just slowly uh, kind of basically bankrupt them or something. Well, I don't think it worked out that way. I, I, I think that al-Qaeda uh, certainly has cause to regret their, their, their decision. Like if I ask you, like, w- what's your answer to why were we attacked on 9-11? Like, wh- what's the answer? Oh, um, if you are willing to accept and you should, the idea that uh, we are the target of radical Islam, you have to understand that uh, the the people who I call the followers of Sayyid Khattab have identified us as the prime enemy of Islam for decades. Um, when they talk about us being big Satan and Israel little Satan, they they show that they have their priorities right. But the whole thing, like when we're always told, like even Santorum there in that the, the CNN Tea Party debate when he was talking with Ron Paul, like basically he's still parroting the line, well, they attacked us because they hate us for our freedoms. Like is that... That's, a, that's a, a shorthand, but it's pretty much what Saeed Khattab said. I mean, he spent some time in this country in the early 50s He's seen everybody at that dance. and Right, exactly. And he was just appalled. And if you're trying to diagnose the sickness that brought the Muslim world down, what is his diagnosis? Westernization, modernization. All of these things are inimical to pure Islam. But the now, first time we were attacked, right, was when, because we had... Uh, we, we we were occupying holy land in Saudi Arabia? Well, I, I mean, Osama bin Laden obviously uh, suffered from a certain amount of mental instability. I, I mean, you, you would ask yourself, doesn't he get the idea that the Saudis wanted us to establish a military presence to frighten Saddam Hussein? I mean, all the Saudi oil, oil sheiks thought about when Saddam marched across the border of Kuwait was, oh my God, we're next. And Saddam made that chilling statement there. In 2005 or 2006, he was asked by a Western European journalist, what was his biggest mistake in the Gulf War? And he said, uh, not waiting until we had nuclear weapons. Uh, he's a very matter-of-fact statement, but if you ponder that, it should send a chill up your spine. The only lesson this guy took from a monumental beating that wrecked his military was, damn, I should have waited till I had nukes. That's the only thing he learned from the Gulf War. Well, uh... I mean, that, that should frighten you. Well, Bob Graham seems to kind of infer that, uh, you know, like, you know how he wrote Intelligence Matters, then he wrote Keys to the Kingdom, which was a fiction book? Yeah. And uh, he goes into what, I think it was, like I told him, I thought it was ingenious of him to write a fiction book to tell the truth. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's been done. But he's basically inferring that, you know, like, just as we know Israel has nukes and they've had them for a long time, but, you know, officially they didn't. He seems to be inferring that, uh, I don't know, maybe Saudi Arabia does too through the AQ Khan network. 
Um, uh, but for, now, for, with for, the for, situation with Pakistan and the turmoil, I mean, Pakistan's a nuclear state. Yeah. Could the could the could the fruitcakes get their hands on the nukes there? Well, this is what everyone fears. It's it's not it's not implausible. Uh, th- this is another point. Uh, when when Bush was accused of linking uh, Saddam Hussein to the 9/11 attacks. In point of fact, Bush was careful to distance himself from some of the sentiments being expressed by people in his administration. Bush said that Saddam Hussein's hand was not involved in the 9-11 attacks. Now, let's speculate. Suppose... Did you say, well, you, did, did you say that Bush said that Saddam Hussein was not involved? With, I th- yes. B- Bush, Bush took pains to distance himself from the notion that Saddam was in some way involved in the 9-11 attack. There were other members of Bush's administration who implied some kind of uh, connection. Um, Stephen Hayes wrote a series of articles for the Weekly Standard in which he convincingly showed that there was um, a contact established between the uh, Mukhabarat, Saddam's secret police, and al-Qaeda. Uh, Hayes concluded that the contacts had not yet reached an operational level. They were talking. So it is it is untrue to state that Saddam had any involvement in the 9-11 attacks. He didn't. And then it's also the... untrue to say that there is no connection between al-Qaeda and Iraq, because at a, a a connection had been established, and but, then, uh, but wasn't it weird how right after nine eleven we had the anthrax attacks and they tried to they want obviously everybody knows that the day of nine eleven you know they were wanted to go into Iraq and the whole thing about well everyone everyone thought initially that the anthrax attacks were another form of Islamist terrorism, but then they the, tried to they tried to the FBI poured cold water on that. But didn't they try to attach the anthrax to Iraq? Well, the FBI poured cold water on that. They said right at the outset, we don't think that this anthrax originated overseas. We think it's homegrown. And then, of course, they uh, they got this guy, Ivan. I, I, I don't want to sound conspiratorial to you, but I am not 100% satisfied that Ivan's acted alone. You know, I, I, I'm I'm willing I'm willing to buy the idea that he was in on it because I mean, my God, the evidence against him is overwhelming. But there's there's also reason to believe that he was not alone and that the FBI's investigation was uh, substandard. Mm-hmm. You know, I I'm just not satisfied that they. It, it, it's like a murder is committed, and you. You get a guy who clearly was part of the crime, but there are other aspects of the crime that lead you to believe that more than one person was involved. Well, like I'm not familiar too much with the whole Ivans thing. Well, I mean, Ivans was obviously disaffected. And he is, you know, is a nut. The the one thing I did read uh, last night, I was looking at uh, your articles on the American Thinker. And yeah, I read, I've written for them in a year. My God, <laughs> I read the the article Bush lied, and you're talking about Janine Bravo. Yeah, that was the first one. Yeah. Oh, that was the first one. Yeah, that's back around 2004. But that I, I, it always annoys me. The Bush lied business always annoyed me because the people who started it so clearly did not believe it. Well, okay, so we're saying, do, would you agree that we went to war based on false intelligence? We went to war based uh, uh, based on bad intelligence. That I mean, it wasn't forged documents. Oh, they played no role at all. Because you know uh, the the the, the, F- the Downing Street memos. Now that that's just the leftist canard. They played no role at all. Every country monitoring Iraq concluded that he retained at least a portion of the arsenal the UN catalogued in 1995. Now that's that's where things become vague. Nobody was prepared to state 
how much he had or precisely what he had, but Saddam was clearly playing a game. Now, we found out after Saddam was captured, the purpose of the game was not to deceive the United States. It was to deceive Iran. Saddam always felt that Iran was his most immediate problem. Now, he wanted the Iranians to believe that he had these terrible weapons, uh, chemical, biological, even nuclear weapons. In deceiving Iran, he managed to fool everyone. Now, uh, the, the Bush lied stuff ground to a halt when, in the primary season of the 2008 election, why? Why did nobody talk about Bush lying? Very simple. Hillary Clinton was running. If you think that Bush was lying, why Hillary and her husband left office on January 20, 2001. She certainly felt that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. So what? did the intel change from January 20th to September 11th? I mean, that's, Hannity used to have fun quoting all these Democrat stalwarts, John Kerry, you know, oh, Saddam has these terrible weapons and he must never be permitted to use them. They're seeing the intelligence that Bush is seeing. And the truth of the matter is, we didn't have anybody on the ground in Iraq. It seems weird, though, that both uh, the, that, the, the Bush administration and the Saudis wanted Iraq, Iraq attacked. Well, why wouldn't they? And then they did. Yeah, well, well, one of the one of the things that look, I mean, uh, I'll be the FBI agent that uh, I was telling you about that was the handler for Abu Sadr. One thing when I was talking to him, he he told me he goes, Jeff, he goes, it seems like you want to point fingers at people, and he goes, you can't really point fingers at people without uh, you know any proof and stuff like that. Well, it's it's but one thing he did say. He goes, you know what, Jeff? He goes, well, you know what's more important than the stuff you're talking about? He goes. If I had all the resources in the world, he goes, I'd want to find out who forged those documents that landed on Cheney's desk. Why? Why would they be important? Because that's the that's what got that's why we went to Iraq because no, of these forged documents yeah, that's about the yellow cake memos. The trivia. So do you think like do you think? Uh, do you think that uh, forgery, Wilson's a liar? Uh, I recall the forgery uh, originated in Italy. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean... Uh, and then the fingers point to Michael Ledeen and... Uh, yeah, Christopher uh, Hutchins proved that uh, Iraqis were making visits to Niger to discuss the purchase of yellow cake. Now, he had this long, drawn-out battle um, in the pages of... Um, I think it was Slate. I was going to say Salon, but I think it was Slate. And he had this lengthy debate. And what it all boiled down to was that, um, well, the Iraqis didn't actually buy yellow cake from Niger. They were negotiating for the purchase. I, I mean, I rem Who was this? De David Korn was his opponent in this debate. And Korn kept saying, all right, all right. So you have established that there were Iraqi agents negotiating with Niger. Uh, how do we know it's yellow cake? Well, Hitchens had a pretty good answer for that. Yellow cake is the only thing Niger has that Iraq would want. <laughs> they can't be negotiating anything else. The only reason an Iraqi would be in Niger was to discuss the purchase of yellow cake. Now, Nobody said that they actually bought it. But they were there negotiating the purchase of it. So the, the whole Downing Street memos collapsed on that, that point. Yes, forgeries stated that Iraq bought yellow cake from Niger. That was proven false. The forgeries were false. But don't you think it's important to find out who forged those documents? Not at this juncture, it's not. It's kind of too late kind of thing? What does it matter? It matter anymore? It doesn't make any difference. But, but the person that forged intelligence... Well, look, I mean... Out there. 
if, if American intel is falling for a forgery, that's the problem that should be eradicated. But nobody but, fell for it except, as far as I know, Cheney and Bush. But every country monitoring Iraq thought that Iraq was working on developing nuclear weapons and that he retained chemical and biological weapons. And the reason they thought this is because they were essentially talking to one another and nobody had any good contacts on the ground in Iraq. And, and uh, I mean, Saddam himself. I'm not, hey, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be a, an apologist for, Dam, for Saddam Hussein. He's a bad guy. You know? Well, understand the why he was doing it. He very much wanted Iran to believe that he was just bristling with an arsenal of terrible weapons. Because he felt if they if they suspected for a moment that he didn't have these things, they would just sweep across his border and depose him. But well, uh, yeah, he. But I don't understand. He like kept Iran at bay, and he forged, fooled everyone else. Forged documents originating from Italy that were funneled through APAC and landed on Cheney's desk. Oh, they landed on everybody's desk. They land, you know. But they landed on Tony Blair's desk. But it doesn't. But you don't think that we should be finding out who? Well, no one to punish those now. documents together and put them in jail for. Uh, no, not an American citizen. It's an Italian. Well, we know. Well, it was funneled through with like. What about how uh, that Phil Girardi? Uh, but the the the. the he the, said the, like the, we. Everybody knows basically Michael Ledeen was involved, right? Yeah, but these these forged documents really didn't play a role in going to war with Iraq. Wasn't that what got what, what got into the, the sixteen words in his? Uh, yeah, but that that was the whole point of the Rob Silverman committee. They they concluded they they examined Joe Wilson's claims and they said. Uh, you know, Joe Wilson's trip to Niger confirms what the Bush administration has been saying. It strengthens it. It doesn't refute it at all. When when Joe Wilson went to Iraq, he was sent there at his wife's suggestion. <laughs> and he was there. I mean, look, remember... We we got this poor jerk screwed to Libby who was left holding the bag. Who was the leak? Oh, why was the leak? was the uh, Armitage, who was an opponent of the Iraq War. <coughs> now, one of I think it was uh, who is it? John Gibson who said, "Let's see, you're Dick Cheney, and you got a guy, very very low rung State Department." rabid Democrat, and he's going around saying that uh, Bush lied, he used uh, bogus information to uh, con us into a war with Iraq. Now, if you're Dick Cheney, your first question is, who the hell is this guy, and how did he come to be sent to Niger? Now, Wilson, without saying it in so many words, implied that the authorization for his trip came down from the vice president's office. Now, that was an outright lie, they, uh, but, but he denied You sound like Sean Hannity right now. No, but the guy actually denied that his wife, Valerie Plain, suggested him for the job. This is a question that I, it, my mind boggles. I've sent letters to people at the National Review on this, and... They all say things like, yeah, we agree, but uh, it's too late now. It's not going to happen. My question is always, why isn't Valerie Plain indicted for perjury? I mean, when she flatly perjured herself. She was asked to write a letter of recommendation just as a... She suggested it. He was asked to because he, was, he, was, he had... It was suggested by his wife. Cheney's attitude was, who is this guy? How, how the hell is this guy who's ripping us a new one every day? How did he, how did he get the assignment? And and Wilson is trying to imply that Cheney sent them over there, which is preposterous nonsense. You can always tell when the left is caught red-handed. They they simply go silent. I mean, Joe Wilson was the man of an hour of the hour until Hitchens 
destroyed him in a series of articles, and then the Rob Silverman committee came out, and they said basically everything that Joe Wilson found out supports what the administration has been saying. I mean, Cheney went from a guy who was a peer, he was a guest speaker at all kinds of Democrat fundraisers. Now he's a non-person. He doesn't exist as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. He's thrown under the bus. He's just a liability. He is an outright liar, a self-aggrandizing liar. That's what Sean Hannity said, too. <laughs> well, I mean, Hannity didn't do any investigative work. He read what Hitchens wrote. Hitchens it was funny because I, I sent that Sean Hannity clip where he said basically the same thing you were saying. I sent it to the F- Well, I mean, all the conservative pundits are calling him lying Joe Wilson. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I don't, this is what I don't understand. Like, I was trying to figure you out in a way, and, like, I, I know... Like you're, you consider yourself a conservative. I'm a conservative, uh, not the kind that Sean Hannity would like, because I'm a, a libertarian on social issues. But would you, like, would you, like, see what I was trying to think was like, I mean, uh, if if it was Democrats that were in the the White House when 9/11 happened, would you be more open to thinking that there might be a possibility of a cover up? If it wasn't like, do you think it's just, well? When you say this is just kind of like a bunch of Democrats or left wings, yeah, there were all kinds of cover up. up. I mean, NORAD changed. You know, they tweaked this story about three different times. I mean, it's the Vanity Fair article on NORAD made it very, very clear that there was a considerable amount of ass covering going on over there. So you agree? Okay, there's three different uh, NORAD timelines. Yeah. So you, obviously, they're, they're, they're trying to find the one that makes them look uh, the least inept. And they and they and the Justice Department considered charging them with uh, perjury or whatever, right? Why not? So you don't have a problem with that? Certainly not. I mean, I don't like politicians. So it's not like you're not like in 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 the frame of mind where Bush could do no wrong. I, I wasn't terribly fond of Bush. I mean, as you said, he seemed like a decent sort. Seems like someone uh, who's approachable, you know. I mean, he, his employees yeah. love him because he can't fire anybody. You know, he's the antithesis of the tough boss. Well, he just seems like he would be, you know, fun at a party if you were yeah. to talk to him and stuff like that. But as, as it still as seems, the president, like, all the God. evidence, it does seem like he's covered. He he's it doesn't seem it it with 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 actual documented public record proof, he's covering for Saudi Arabia. Well, he's, he's, what he's doing is maintaining that special relationship that uh, I don't think they deserve, but, uh, you know, as long as they have those oil wells, uh, they'll get away with stuff. Well, why would, why couldn't we have just invaded Saudi Arabia instead of Iraq and took in over their oil? Well, you see, this is a point that I have made so many times to people when they say, well, you know, we went to war with Iraq for the oil. I said, now let's, let's continue that thought. So, okay, we mobilized the most potent fighting machine in the history of humankind, and we, we crush the Iraqi army, and we occupy their country, and we set up a new government that proceeds to order, offer, hand over all the best and most lucrative oil contracts to, oh, Russia and China. Well, we, we installed How come we didn't How come we didn't get them? <laughs> I mean, what the hell? We went to war with Iraq to steal their oil, and we forgot to steal it. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things. I, people say these things, and I ask them, repeat that. You know, repeat it slowly. Let it sink in. We went to war in order to steal oil that we didn't steal. Is there something wrong with that analysis? Do you see a flaw? Well, what about, like, we, we, we try, didn't we try to install Ahmed Chalabi there, that little... Scoundrel well, we found out that the, the uh, guy had no, he had no support. Any wanted to hear. Look, I, I mean, if, if you want to be a real imperialist, uh, and, and some guy had written this, uh, I think it was on Real Clear Politics a couple of days ago. He said, you know, these endless sophomoric debates about American imperialism. Why don't we have a real debate? In other words, why don't we just go over and take over? Saudi Arabia's oil, 
and take over Iraq's oil and crush the price of worldwide oil. I mean, sink it from $100 a barrel to $15 a barrel. And the American economy explodes. Consumers get rich. Hey, the oil companies aren't too happy, but to hell with them. And then we can talk about imperialism. Okay, yes, you know, you're right. You got us. This was an act of pure, unadulterated imperialism, and we're just loving it. But right now, we're hearing about American imperialism, and we're paying through the nose for oil, and these scoundrels who do not have our best interests at heart are growing obscenely wealthy on American oil money. Well, that's why it's imperialism. Aren't you supposed to get something for being an imperial power? It, it <laughs> seems like there's a, there's people that are holding that are in powerful positions that have the interests of themselves are more important than the interests of their country. Well, I mean, there's no one in government who's who's profiting personally from Saudi oil. I mean, Cheney's a rich man. Cheney's worth like 30 million bucks, but he had to divest himself of his shares in Halliburton on assuming the office of vice president. I mean, he had he had worked out a good severance package there. There's no question about that. But nobody in the Bush administration made money off, off the war on terror. I'd be interested in what you think about this. Uh, there was a – Joe Wilson was – do, do, do the points I'm making resonate with you here? I mean, you, you got to admit, there, there, there's some appeal to the idea that if you're going to be accused of imperialism, why the hell not be an imperial power and take all the oil that you're buying right now? Just take it. Well, I, I I don't think the agenda is about getting oil, though. I don't I don't think it's it, not obviously. But again, you you will find people who will say with a straight face, it was all about oil. We went in to steal their oil, and I asked them, how is it that we forgot to do it? <laughs> well, you you make kind of, a good point there. Like I can't. I, I yeah, kind of. What it slipped our mind, you know? Oh, gee, we that was a hell of a war. Gee, we won that real easy. What was, what were you there for again? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't remember. It was something. Well, when it comes to Iraq, uh, Bill Crystal and Joe Wilson were having a debate uh, one time, and Joe Wilson ended up getting Bill Crystal to admit the reason that we went to Iraq was to change the dynamics of the Middle East. So oh, I, I said that all along. What What does that mean to you? I don't. I like. What does that mean? I, I don't. My feeling is that if you tried to sell it to the American public as realpolitik, which is exactly what it was, you you wouldn't win. Americans are viscerally anti-military. They're fine with defending this country. They can, you know, Americans can even be bellicose about defending our shores, but the I mean, it goes back to the America Firsters before World War II, you know, keep America out of foreign wars. American politicians won't get elected by offering to fight an elective war. public doesn't like the idea. Now, in terms of a long-range visionary policy, ousting Saddam Hussein had to be at the top of the list. If I had been elected president in 2000 as a Republican, I don't know if I would have had the stones to admit it publicly, but I would have told everyone in my administration, including members of the opposite party that whom I trusted, Saddam Hussein is not going to survive my first term. That would be at the top of my list, toppling Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and then they because the Middle East, and, and then they they had, you know, they they were trying to get Ahmed Chalabi in there, and Salim Chalabi. Well, Chalabi turned out to be something of a fraud. I mean, he just didn't right. have any real public support. But his uncle, Salim Chalabi, was appointed as the judge. It was supposed to be an un unbiased, uh, you know, uh, trial or conviction of Saddam Hussein. Salim Chalabi. Ahmed Chalabi's uncle gets installed in there through an 
through. Have you ever? Do you know who you know who Douglas Fife is? Fife is right. Oh sure. And Mark Zell. Uh, Mark Zell, no, I've heard the name, but I, you know, I'm not associating him with anything. They had a they had a website where they were offering contracts for uh, different contracts in the Middle East. It was, and it was you, in in order to get a contract in Iraq, you had to go through Douglas Fife and Mark Zell, who had connections with. Ahmed Chalabi and Salim Chalabi, Salim Chalabi, who was appointed to try Saddam Hussein. Like, it all seems like it's one big... Oh, look, there were going to be people who would make money off the establishment of a new government in Iraq. There's, there's no question about that. But it, but but Douglas Fife and Mark Zell, were, their, their, their firm or whatever they had, they had a website there um, where you had to go through them to get the contract to go into Iraq. Yeah, they... Uh... You know, uh, who's the guy Plunkett of Tammany Hall? He says, I I seen my opportunities and I took them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, Plunkett, I mean, I, I see coining, how... Uh... Plunkett was famous for coining the phrase honest graft. But these people <laughs> that are in positions of power are supposed to put the interest of their country before the, their own pocketbook. Well, yeah, but I think they, they probably satisfied themselves that while they, they were enriching their, their own uh, coffers, they were also helping America's long-range prospects. I mean, look, when you got Saddam Hussein in power, in, right in the center, in the heart of the Middle East, it's like having a cancerous tumor in your body. Hmm? You, 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 the, the Middle East, the whole region is always going to be festering. It's, 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 it's always boiling. Now, with Saddam Hussein out, it's, it's like he just turned off the gas. But in a way, he was our proxy to keep the extremists at bay, in a way. He, he, uh, he I don't think for that it. works in the long run, because he is an avowed enemy of America. I remember, he was alone among the world's leaders in offering no words of uh, condolence when the Twin Towers came down, when the Pentagon was hit. I mean, you know, Kim Jong-il had something nice to say, for God's sake. <laughs> You know, Saddam is the only world leader who just, he didn't say anything. He was pleased, and that was that, you know. <laughs> but as I said, uh, coming into office in the wake of the 2000 election, the first priority for an American president should have been the removal of Saddam Hussein. If you remember in 1998, before Bill Clinton launched Operation Desert Fox and bombed Saddam extensively for four days, they got a resolution through Congress calling for the removal of Saddam Hussein. It's, it's funny, Operation Desert Fox, can you imagine if a Republican president was associated with a military operation named after a Nazi general? <laughs> In Rommel was the Desert Fox. Yeah, that's not very good. Yeah, that's okay. no, it meant nothing because Clinton was Democrat. But can you imagine the firestorm if a Republican president did something like that? Uh, I, I, I used to get a kick out of uh, Carville and uh, the gala showing up, uh, making the round of all the cable talk shows. When the teams of inspectors... Uh, Saddam had been, he, he hadn't been apprehended yet, but he had been toppled. And they're looking for the uh, WMD, not finding any. The gal on Carville are hitting all the talk shows and saying, well, you know, uh, the reason they're not finding any is that we, we probably got it all in 1998. Yes, give Bill Clinton the credit for ridding us of Saddam's arsenal. And... That raises a few interesting questions. You know, you go back a few years to 1998. Now, at the time, Carville and Begala, they, they were also on point for, for Bill Clinton. And they said, well, we are targeting WMD facilities and Republican Guard barracks. Interesting. We're not at war, but we're bombing barracks of Republican Guard units. 
We're killing soldiers who don't know that they're at war. Now, I'm not quick to throw around words like atrocity and war crime, mm-hmm. but uh, that kind of sounds like a war crime to me, doesn't it? <laughs> it seems a lot of the things we You're did. bombing soldiers who have no idea that they're at war, all of a sudden American planes are overhead pounding them? Well, we also had, like, Bush brought Bandar into the war room and he discussed plans to attack Iraq with him. Like, well, why would be Bush be <laughs> discussing inf- classified information with Bandar? Well, I, I wouldn't have done it, but, uh, I, again, when, when, when Clinton's, uh, I love the phrase, the slime squad, someone applied to Carville and Begallon because they were the ones responsible for smearing any woman who raised sexual harassment charges against Bill but when they said we we targeted Republican Guard barracks and WMD facilities, wouldn't you like to know a little more about those facilities? What 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 were they targeting? You're talking during the Clinton uh, presidency. Yeah, what what were they targeting in 1998? I mean, the same people who were enthusiastic about Bill's defanging of Saddam Hussein, oh, this massive bombing campaign dropped more bombs in four days and dropped in two uh, two of the most uh, hotly contested weeks of the first Gulf War. I mean, all these bombs were dropped on WMD facilities. That kind of suggests that there were WMD facilities, doesn't it? I mean, if there weren't, what were they bombing? You know, so as I said... Hillary Clinton runs for president in the starting the end of 2007. We don't hear a peep about Bush lied. That that phrase has been retired temporarily. Why? Because Hillary's running. And if you say that Bush lied, then Hillary has to say, "Oh, well, yeah, I mean, we thought that he had all these weapons of mass destruction, and as you know, my husband bombed the hell out of his WMD facilities, but I guess they just somehow vanished into thin air between the time that we left office and, you know, the attacks of 9-11. That, I don't think that ploy would work too well. So, again, I, I, I've never seen such a classic example of people caught in a flat-out lie, and they essentially just uh, walk away from it. They expect to be protected by the mainstream media, and they are. I mean, nobody comes to Al Gore and says, you know, all those, all those speeches you made about Saddam's WMD capacity and how he must never be allowed to threaten America with it, and you you did a 180 degree turn and condemned Bush for saying that he had the weapons that you said he had. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, like, cynicism. Bush is only going on the intelligence that it's he was. He can go by. I mean, they put put an intelligence report on your desk. You either believe it now. Like there is an argument. Clinton ended up bombing aspirin factories. As far as... Maybe. I mean, it may have been an aspirin factory, although as some people have been pointing out, you know, this this, this business, this this false dichotomy, it's either uh, an aspirin factory or a munitions plant. How about a factory that was originally intended for the production of pharmaceuticals and can be easily retrofitted to produce munitions? You know, in other words, instead of making it this black or white choice, it's either an aspirin factory or they're producing weapons. How about acknowledging that it could very easily do both? But you'll acknowledge, though, that the the speech that uh, Powell gave at the UN was. Oh yeah, he 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 got himself out on a limb. Uh, I mean, and the aluminum George tube. Bennett saying it's a slam dunk. Like I mean. Uh, well, that, that's the problem. When Tenet says it's a slam dunk and Bush is asking him, I, I, I mean, are you really 100% sure about this? 
Because I, I remember arguing with libertarians on their chat line in, in 2003. I lost a bet to two of these guys. I bet that they would find WMD by, I think, I forget, June 20th or something was the date. You know, I lost a few hundred bucks. And I, I even said, okay, uh, I don't like losing this bet. I would have preferred to win it. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I've got to, I, I, I still have to wrap my mind around the idea that Saddam Hussein allowed his two sons to be killed, his entire regime to be toppled, and himself to be hunted down like a gas station bandit, all to protect nothing. Now, I just suffer... A... He was he was saying, come on in here and take... A... Like, yeah, I, 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 you know, I have a conceptual... Weapons inspector even said... Uh... You know, there was nothing. Uh, the top. Uh, I thought me. that on the eve of the invasion of Iraq, Saddam Hussein was going to cut the branch off behind Bush and just leave him to fall. Uh, he's, he's got an American army massed on his borders, and he's. I thought he was prepared to say, "All right, look, you know, just." We'll stop playing the game. I'm not going to run you around from one place to another, and we're not going to change scheduling. You just come in and look wherever you feel like it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get. I'll, I'll just look any way down. you like. That Bush was only going on the information yeah. that he was given. Okay. But does I mean does anyone have a satisfactory explanation for why Saddam allowed his whole regime to be destroyed to protect? Nothing. But he didn't. Did he have a choice though? Like, I mean, he said, "Come on in. I don't got nothing." They're saying that he has these mobile uh, weapons now, Blix, and all this stuff. And Blicks would have and absolutely man loved and, yeah, Blix anything. Wanted to leave Bush with egg on his face, and Saddam wouldn't cooperate. I mean, Blix was getting very, very testy and petulant there, as he's saying. He's saying in public, you know. Uh, we really want more cooperation than we've been getting from the Iraqis. Now, what he's undoubtedly saying in private is, doesn't this asshole Saddam Hussein understand that I'm trying to help him? <laughs> that I am trying to stop Bush from invading? Won't the guy give me any cooperation here? I mean, Blix was beside himself by this. I mean, he's signaling in such a heavy-handed manner that he wants to embarrass Bush, and Saddam's not playing. Uh, what's going on? The only conclusion a sane person can reach is that Saddam is protecting something. I mean, as it turns out, he allowed his regime to be destroyed, and he didn't have the weapons that Bush promised to find. Was it, Bush was the one who ordered the inspectors to leave so the bombings could start. Well, I mean, this is after, you know, how many deadlines passed? And in February of 2001, uh, Powell said that there, Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction. Then he totally changed his course and gave that speech at the UN <laughs> with, with George Tennant sitting right beside him, or sitting right behind him. Yeah, I, I mean... Again, the uh, the idea that Bush was rubbing his hands together and cackling over the failure to find weapons of mass destruction is is insane. I mean, Bush, as a result of the perceived victory in Afghanistan, Bush was sitting on some very very high approval ratings. Now his approval ratings, uh, there was a slight dip. And then when he invaded Iraq, the stock market had this phenomenal Saddam rally. I mean, it picked up 4,000 points, uh, you know, and defeating Saddam and whatnot. The market went wild. Everyone was happy. Well, let, let's focus now, on Tenant for a second. If Bush finds weapons of mass destruction, he wins the 2004 election in a landslide. He turned a landslide win into a cliffhanger through his failure to find the weapons that he promised to find. Now, if you think that Bush is pleased when they're not finding weapons, 
I don't know what planet you must be living on. I mean, well, his dad did the right thing. Yeah, I mean, Bush and Cheney must have been kicking over the furniture in the White House when these, you know, they couldn't produce the weapons of mass destruction. Well, okay, so you agree that there was no weapons of mass destruction? Well, look, there's this uh, Romanian intel, intel guy who says, uh, what, what's his name, uh, George uh, uh, Popeye? I have I don't know. I mean, he's a guy who insisted that the Soviet Union worked with Saddam to remove the weapons to Syria. Now the Israelis say that it's in this valley in Lebanon. They they know they're there. Okay, the bottom line is you're not going to prove that. But, but like I mean, the point is like we know that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Now we we know this. Well, we knew there were in 1995, and the terms of the and, and during Bush one or during Bush one's uh, uh, proper, um, you know, uh, invasion or whatever he did it. He did, you know, he did what he had to do, and he got out. Yeah, the terms all of the whole fire though required the whole weapons to account for his weapon. program. The whole thing, the whole program was annihilated during the first Desert Storm strike. Well, no, in 1995, the, the UN cataloged uh, Saddam's remaining arsenal, and he still had some biological and chemical stuff. And uh, but we have Cheney just, like, it was just, he was just uh, played over the Thanksgiving weekend with Sean Hannity uh, doing the interview about his new book, and Cheney's sitting there still saying, <laughs> well, you know, there, he did have the capacity to build them, and he did have certain ingredients, etc., and... Like why 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 won't Cheney just say no? We were wrong. We, we, there were we we there was well we, we got the, false intelligence. Somebody fed us false intelligence that landed on my desk um, and other people's desks, like you say. Um, we were wrong. We he had no weapons of mass destruction, um, and the, the whole war in Iraq should be ended because that's the reason we went in there. And See, I don't think that's the reason we went in there. I mean, there were better reasons to go in there. But that's the reason. But uh, I'm one thing: liberal Democrats will never mention. You don't want the next attack to be a mushroom cloud. Yeah, they they talk about the K report occasionally, but Democrats never ever mention the Dwelfer report, which was issued roughly the same time as the K report. But Cheney was just on Sean Hannity. Well, what did the, the other day report say? Pete from a couple months ago. It says it, it, it doesn't matter what Saddam has at any given time. The question is, how quickly could he get a weapons program online? And they found that the structure was available. For example, if he wanted to turn out chemical and biological weapons, he could have gotten that underway in a matter of days, and he could have had weapons in a matter of weeks. Well, one one place we do know that has weapons of mass destruction is Pakistan. Yeah. And there's also ample enough evidence that the ISI was involved to some extent, with 9-11. Why didn't we go and take care of them? What, with well, once again, we, we need Pakistan. For what? Oh, we, we, we felt that they, they were a buffer, that they, they were a way of keeping tabs on the, the jihadists who you know camping out in Afghanistan. Well, we could keep our own tabs on the jihadists. We had the NSA, we had the Alex Station, we had the Yemen hub, uh, you know, we we were we we had access to the to Al Qaeda's communication. Uh, yeah, but the, I, I mean, it, it it all broke down. I mean, the, the the communication between not just the FBI and the CIA, but other American intelligence gathering sources. It was, it was very very poor. You you had jealousies and rivalries going, and the level of cooperation was just shockingly low. But uh, look, but we, one of the number. things we learned, what what happened in the wake of Saddam being dragged out of his spider hole? Well, Muammar Gaddafi announces he's renouncing his nuclear weapons program. Huh? Uh, what what program is that? Oh, his nuclear weapons program. Yeah, he's pretty far along. Gee, we didn't know that. Who but who are you going to believe, Gaddafi? <laughs> yeah, I mean, who, you know, this is the nature of our intelligence. He tells us he's he's giving up his nuclear weapons program, and we're scratching our heads, saying, uh, "What program? We didn't know you, we didn't know you were that far along." 
<laughs> you know, I mean, we're just totally asleep at the switch. So how does it just change from, like, Powell in two, February 2001 saying there's no weapons of mass destruction? Rumsfeld, had, Rumsfeld admitted there was no weapons of mass destruction, and we go there under the pretense of... No, not not in uh, not not that early on. Uh, I mean, again, everybody thought that he had retained something, and no one was quite clear on how much or precisely what. Do you think that there that we that uh, the administration used fear to sell the war with Iraq? Well, they certainly used fear of a, a, another devastating attack on, say, an American city. Because we have, like you look at it from this standpoint. Suppose you're George Bush. Okay, now if 9/11 attacks occurred on your watch, that's not a not a good recommendation, right there. Now, what happens in the wake of 9/11 if 50,000 New Yorkers are killed by a biological weapon, and that weapon is traced to Iraq? Well, we don't have to guess. Bush gets impeached. It's it's as simple as that. He has no possible defense in the wake of 9-11 for allowing a biological attack on an American city. Every single one of Bush's detractors, including the most rabid, would be screaming for his head if 50,000 Americans were killed by a weapon traceable to Iraq. Okay. And you know what? I, 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 I would be what about, one of the people. Uh, well, what about 3,000? Are they not worth the same as 50,000? Like, yeah, but I, I mean, you could at least argue that, well, my God, who, you know, we never expected them to hijack planes and fly them into buildings. I mean, we knew something was up, but we didn't know exactly what. Well, there's but after all, this, what about all the happened? warnings? Though? Like, I mean, uh, uh, Eleanor Hill did the whole chronology of warnings. That they had, like, I mean, do you think when George Tennant heard that a plane hit the World Trade Center, he was thinking, "What a bad pilot"? He knew right away. Well, I mean, he knew right away that, that it was. That's up. a matter of conjecture. As I said, I, I, I'm not the head of an intelligence agency. When I was awakened and I was told the plane hit the North Tower, my first thought was, uh, "Oh, that could be a terrorist that's attack." True. But they, you know, maybe the pilot. I don't know. I mean, I just don't know yet. I have to turn on the television and, and hear what they're saying. I know it's a terrorist attack when the second plane hits. That that removes all doubt. But uh, well, you have one. well, you have all you have the Jinka plot. You knew that they were uh, up to something. With the... my my first guess was that it was a terrorist attack, but I don't know that. I know it when the second well, you plane. that is not privy. To all the intelligence, yeah, exactly. and, Ch- and Cheney. And yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming any special insight here. I think most it was people, a terrorist attack. Yeah, most people felt it was. A yeah, it's a terrorist attack. But George Bush is thinking, "What a bad pilot." That's what he says he was thinking. I don't know. Was he? Maybe he was. I mean, look. If, if it had turned out, if there was one plane that flew into a building and nothing else. And it turned out that pilot error or whatever, I'd say, okay, gee, that's a that's kind of a freakish accident. That's a terrible thing. Absolutely, and that's 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 feasible. But when the second plane hits, well, then, then there's no doubt anymore. Then you know that the country's under attack. You just don't know, you know, how many shoes are going to drop. So why turns it, out there were two more planes. So why, why is been twelve Bush, more? How do we why know? Isn't Bush contacting the military? Why is Rumsfeld sitting in his office not answering the phone? <coughs> well, again, this this has been debated endlessly. Obviously, there were too many channels. They had to streamline the levels of communication. Why did for an air traffic controller to finally get to NORAD? That's that's many many steps. I mean that that takes more minutes than it should. The the phone calls that came from uh, Flight 11 that scumbag Griffin says are fake, like those prove that uh, it wasn't an accident. You got Betty Ong and Christine Sweeney or whatever yeah. telling everybody. So we were we knew at 8:40, like before 8:46, that there was something up. Yeah, I, I mean the the air traffic controllers apparently they have to reach their supervisor. And then they supervise. Now, this is no longer true. They have streamlined these procedures now. But at the time, the air traffic controller has to get 
to the supervisor, who then checks it on a different set of radar screens. If the supervisor is satisfied that a hijacking is underway, the supervisor has to contact the FAA. The FAA has to review the available information, and if it warrants it, they contact NORAD needs, you know, they, they, they bring the military in. Minutes are ticking away here. Exactly. Crucial minutes. Yeah, I mean, is there any at reason the time, was there any way of just going from the air traffic control to the military? No. There was no way of doing it. You had to, you had to follow steps. You had to go up the ladder. And minutes are ticking away. On the other hand, just to play the devil's advocate here, let's say that somehow or another you can persuade the military that this this is their baby. They they they, they got to handle this. Okay, but I okay. So now the military reaches George Bush. They remember, there's no protocol for shooting down a domestic airliner. They had exercises in October. What? They had exercises for for those protocols. They, they oh, I mean, they, they have these exercises. They're ongoing. They have them all the time. But can you imagine what they would have said if Bush ordered a domestic airliner shot down over the New York metropolitan area? So you bring down a 767, and it falls squarely on Midtown Manhattan. You may kill as many people as you lost on the whole day. Well, Who knows how many people you'll kill? It, but, but if you're gonna, if you know those planes are being used as uh, missiles, but you don't. But the one, what if it you know, Bush knew Condoleezza Rice informed Bush that uh, the first plane was a commercial airliner before he even went into the classroom. Yeah, so now, if if you're Bush, you say to yourself, a hijacking. Why would I shoot it down? Why wouldn't I wait? for the hijackers to land and tell me their demands. You know, they're going to take it to Cuba or something and tell me their demands. <laughs> uh, you're going to shoot down an American domestic airliner over a heavily populated city. No, but those, those the protocol should, obviously, that you should have those orders in place in case it needs to be. I mean, even now, knowing what we did know, would you, would you have pulled the trigger? Would you have ordered the plane shot down? If it's a, you know, is it, where is it now? Oh, it's a, you know, it's over midtown Manhattan. Well, if we shoot it down, aren't we going to kill lots of people? Well, yes, that seems unavoidable. Right, but <laughs> you know, if, I mean, if it has to do with killing the people in the... See, you're going you're gonna to lose people here. Uh, the amount yeah, is going to range... Where are you going to lose? Your, your best case scenario, you're going to lose everyone on the plane, and maybe only 500 people on the ground. But, again, that all depends. That's, that's like chaos theory now. That's a purely random element. But, again, depending we, on where the back, plane lands. That gets us back, though, to the point that there was no shoot-down orders that communicated. Well, after the planes hit the trade center, yes, the, the idea that the planes coming from... Uh, uh, coming towards targets in Washington, D.C., you don't have the, uh, I mean, it's, yes, it's still a populated area, but if you shot down UA-93 in Pennsylvania, yeah, you're going to kill everybody on the plane. You're not going to kill a lot of people on the ground. So certainly if they had been able to, but they, weren't, they would have been willing to shoot that down because they didn't have authorization from the proper authority, and the only two people that could authorize it was Bush or Cheney, both of which never issued shoot-down orders. Well, when the aide says, uh, do the orders still stand, and Cheney says, yes. I mean, of course he's talking about a shoot-down order. If he's talking about a stand-down order, that's the story of the century. Why, why wouldn't every journalist in the world be pouncing on that story? I mean, that's... That's the biggest. What 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 stand down order? I mean, you know, what are we talking about here? <laughs> but the, the story of the century. But Cochrane, it doesn't matter what 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 Cheney says to Cochrane because Cheney doesn't have the authorization to issue shoot down orders. Well, he he had obviously received it from Bush. I mean, it, they transmitted it, it, it along the line. Cheney <laughs> issuing a shoot down order is the same as a stand down because he's he, not. He's not issuing it. He's conveying it. 
the <laughs> distinction is important. He's received the order from Bush, and he's conveying. Why would Bush contact Cheney and give tell and relay shoot down orders to him? Why didn't he relay it to the proper uh, well, channel? Cheney was in the bunker. I mean, Cheney is the channel to, to go through there. No, because we know that the military, we know that the military were not did not accept Cheney's order. We know that only, it could only come from Rumsfeld or Bush. And instead of contacting Cheney, when all they did was talk about what, what he was going what he was going to say when he addressed the nation, he should have caught, he could have relayed the order to his military aide that's standing right beside him, just like Cochran's. Well, that's what uh, the guy asked. Cheney's him. military aide. The, the guy asked him. He said, "Do the orders still stand?" It doesn't matter what Cheney what what he's asking Cheney because Cheney doesn't have the authorization. He's not in the executive. Brent, he 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 doesn't have the power to do that. No, if if he if he's spoken to Bush and he's received Bush's orders, he can convey that. Now let's see. Is something? But that's the thing. That's the whole point, Ron. Bush, he says, okay. The the story is that basically is trying to say now that Bush gave Cheney the orders to shoot down, but that those are the same as stand-down orders because Cheney doesn't have the proper authority. Shortly after Cheney gave the order, the military aide returned and said the aircraft, now believed to be 60 miles out, had just been confirmed as a hijacking. The aide wanted to make sure that the military had the authority to attack the plane. As Joshua Bolton, later the White House chief of staff, but then just one of several deputies, recalled... The vice president said yes again, and then the aide asked a third time. He said, just confirming, sir, authority authority to engage. And the vice president, his voice got a little annoyed then, said, I said yes. Now, let's see. The aide left in the conference room, went quiet as the enormity of the exchange fell upon all who had heard it. From down the table, Bolton broke the silence. Boldly, he suggested that Cheney call George W. Bush to confirm the shoot-down order Cheney had just given. Now, let's see. But the 9-11 Commission said there's no evidence of this call of Bush giving Cheney. Or the call is not on record. I mean, that people... Cheney says he spoke to Bush. Bush said he spoke to Cheney, and people around them said that yes, Cheney was on the phone, presumably with Bush. But che- but Bush has his own mouth. He could have relayed those orders to the proper authorities. Why would he? Re- why would he relay them to Cheney, and then Cheney relay them to the military when the military isn't going to follow Cheney's orders because he's not in the chain of command to give those orders? But uh, that that is contradicted by the military aide saying just confirming sir authority to engage. So they, once again, authority to engage. They're making a momentous decision here. They're talking about shooting down a domestic airliner, an American airliner on a domestic flight, and they're talking about shooting it down. This is you know this is unprecedented. Nothing nothing like that has ever been contemplated before. Hmm. Well, they did have exercises where everybody in the chain of command knew that Bush and Rumsfeld were the only ones that had the authorization. Let's see. And it doesn't help, I guess, that 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 Rumsfeld's in his office not answering the phone. His, I guess his, his military aide could have answered the phone, but he didn't either. It doesn't help that Bush was sitting in the classroom doing nothing uh, for all those minutes, those crucial minutes. I mean... Rumsfeld and Cheney, or Rumsfeld and Bush, were the only ones that had the authority to issue shoot-down orders to the military. Bush conveying orders to Cheney means nothing. It, it, it would not be accepted by the chain of command in the military, just like we know from the records now. We have the records where Cheney's orders are communed to the military at 1031, and they will not accept the orders because it's coming from Cheney. Uh, I, I don't know where you've uh, heard this uh, business about the military not accepting the orders. Even Rumsfeld uh, admitted the that... The aide is confirming the order with Cheney. Rumsfeld even said that Cheney's not in the chain of command. He admitted Cheney's not in the chain of command. He's not, issue, he's not authorized to give those orders. Like, this is all documented in public record. This isn't conspiracy theory. And that's where I have the problem of, you know, the, the, the truthers 
are saying, you know, Cheney's uh, issuing stand down, and and the debunkers are are saying, you know, like it, it's just everybody's missing the real issue here. The real issue is why would Bush give the stand down order through Cheney? Why didn't he just convey it through the proper chain of command? And with all his prior knowledge, he knew. That okay, now here's a fact. Mike Williams section on the shoot-down order. Minetta told the 9-11 Commission that he believed the Cheney conversation he heard related to a shoot-down order. So Minetta believes it was a shoot-down order that applies when he said he was at the PEOC from 9-20. However, the 9-11 Commission says his authorization came much later. Now, in the report, Written, the vice president stated that he called the president to discuss the rules of engagement for the CAP. He recalled feeling that it did no good to establish the CAP unless the pilots had instructions on whether they were authorized to shoot if the plane would not divert. Mineta doesn't know what the order was. That yeah, he said the president signed off on that concept. The president said he remembered such a conversation and that it reminded him of when he had been an interceptor pilot. The president emphasized to us that he had authorized the shoot-down of hijacked aircraft. The vice president's military aide told us he believed the vice president spoke to the president just after entering the conference room, but he didn't hear what they said. Rice, who entered the room shortly after the vice president and sat next to him, remembered hearing him inform the president, Sir, the CAPs are up. Sir, they want to know what to do. Then she recalled him hearing him say, yes, sir. She believed this conversation occurred a few minutes, perhaps five, after they entered the conference room. We believe this call would have taken place sometime before 10.10 to 10.15. And then they go on to point out there is no documentary evidence for this call, and that's a separate issue. Go read the chapter. <laughs> what did you just say again? <laughs> Let's see. So There's no documentary evidence of this call. No, it's not recorded. Okay. <laughs> and then and then Rumsfeld and Bush say they can't remember what. Oh man, it's just can't you see it, Ron? Can't you see it? I I just see confusion. <laughs> well, isn't that the best thing to have, eh? No, confusion is not a good thing to have. If Bush, all Bush, it, it, to this all this confusion could have been. Uh, uh, you know, resolved and never happened in the first place, if Bush just could have gave the order himself. Rumsfeld could have picked up the phone and gave the order himself. You know, it, it, R Bush could have relayed the, the, the order to his military aide that's standing right beside him. They all had military aides standing right beside him. But for some reason, Bush gives supposedly the shoot-down order to Cheney that won't be accepted in the military chain of command? That's yeah, see, the problem with that problem, issue right though, there, I, that no one wants there's, to There's it. obviously a disconnect here, because I've never heard anything about the military not accepting the shoot-down order. I, I've just never heard that. Oh, there's, uh, it, it, it's documented. Uh, there's, it, that's, that's, uh, that information just uh, surfaced recently, uh, within, I guess, a month or so. They they have the uh, the recordings of needs in the military and everything where they're ish they have uh, Cheney's issue um, at uh, ten thirty one and uh, they said they wouldn't be accepted anyway. I could send you a link for right now, which I'll do if you want to read it real quick. I just got to get on the computer here and it, it'll it'll show you everything. Um, I'll just go to the email. I'll send it to your email right now. You check it out right now. Um, but that's where I was like, wow, this is a, uh, you know, Jim James Dorman. He he did a he he wrote up a whole uh, piece on uh, that issue because he he doesn't like the truth or stupidity either about this whole shoot down stand down thing, eh? But he's saying, like he said, that's the real issue is not being looked at by either side, nor the debunkers nor the truthers are paying attention to the real issue at hand. But I'll send you this link. And see what you think about what it says here. It should have everything in it. Um, here we go. There we go. Oh, okay. I'll just send it to you in the same link. I see the you sent me the thing there from uh, Mike Mike Williams. Have you ever spoke to Mike Williams yourself? Yeah. You have. Yeah. Do you think he would ever talk to me or? Um. It wouldn't hurt to ask him to talk. Oh, you know what? Um. I, I don't. I don't want to mislead you. Uh, I've exchanged many emails 
with Mike Williams. But uh, no, he and I have not spoken over the phone. Mm-hmm. He, he's in like Britain or England or something yeah, like that? Yeah, he's, he's in Britain. I just sent you the link. It's a link to Raw Story. Uh, let's try to find where, what is the section here? It should have everything there. There's evidence. Military officials ignore Cheney's 9-11 shoot-down order. And this was published September 8, 2011. And it goes through everything and has links. And it should even have the... Uh, I wonder if I'm looking in the wrong place here. Yeah. I'm going to try, try to go back in time to the older, older version here. Mm-hmm. So I remember seeing something on 9-11 Myths. Anthony Summers also confirmed that in his research. It might even be where it uh, surfaced from. Like, you'll, you, you'd agree that Anthony Summers is credible, don't It seems to be. Yeah. Yeah, because he doesn't like... Like, yeah, he finds all those conspiracy theories offensive and everything, too. Which I don't blame him. Like that's so true. Okay. I remember seeing some useful article on this. How did I see that? I know it must have been on nine eleven. Yes. But I, I sent you that link there. If if you got it, it should be a. Uh... Huh. For reason I can't find this right now. Ah, well, I don't want to waste your time here. I'll I'll come up with it eventually. I'll send send you a link. Oops. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, what about uh? I don't know. You can take a look at that link uh, when you get a chance yeah. about that. But uh, what do you think about, like, uh, George Tennant receiving the Medal of Freedom? You think he should have received the Medal of Freedom? I wouldn't have given it to him, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like uh, Bush's memorable uh, decision to laud Brownie for his efforts <laughs> in Louisiana. Hurricane <laughs> <Okay>, Katrina. <laughs> Like, I'm glad. Bush is not a lucky man. <laughs> you know, I mean, when, there are some people who go through life and they make mistakes, and those mistakes just don't haunt them. They don't come back and bite them. Bush is a guy who he gets punished when he makes a mistake. <laughs> he just doesn't get away with things. Well, I've never went, uh, you know, out of my way or even went looking to try and say Bush is a bad guy. Yeah. I mean, it just it, the, the evidence points towards him covering up for Saudi Arabia, and and that well again that, like, that phrase covering up may be a little too strong. I mean, okay, the attack happened and it shouldn't have, but it did, and he has to preserve this special relationship with the Saudis. Now, if we were more independent, you know, if we had other energy resources, uh, I think we could take a much much tougher line with the Saudis. Well, I mean, yeah, but like you said, this 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 none of this seems like it's about oil. It doesn't it just if it was well, oil, it's like the background said, the extent that, uh, you know, like when the American economy is booming, that's one thing. But now the American economy is fragile. The, the last thing we need is for the Saudis to uh, you know, start tightening the spigot and you know we we are in a perilous situation, and it's it's odd that while we felt that ousting Saddam Hussein and replacing his totalitarian state with his fledgling democracy is a good good thing for long term prospects, right now, immediately, in the days and weeks in front of us, the absence of the threat of of Saddam Hussein relieves a lot of Saudi Arabia's worries. When you think about it, I mean, you know, the, 
But isn't it we take crap from them, but they had to give back something in return because, you know, we were the only thing standing between them and Saddam Hussein. Now Saddam Hussein's not around. Well, you know... Uh, they don't, they're not worried about anything now. Well, you know John O'Neill's uh, famous statement where he said, uh, uh, you know, all the answers, all the clues allowing us to dismantle Osama bin Laden's organization can be found in Saudi Arabia. It sounds right. But we still don't do anything about it. Yeah, sounds right. Hey, listen, i got to get going here. Uh, call me anytime. All right, well, like I said, it was. Uh, I thank you very much for uh, giving me to talk with you and no problem. Everything, uh, you, like uh, you do know, I recorded the call, right? I suspected as much. Okay, can I put it on the internet? I mention it in advance, but I, I since I assumed you would, there's no harm done. Since I'm the notorious uh, Canadian prank caller, <laughs> I figured you'd know. Well, it's I, funny, I, I Val Samo used to get me on the phone, and you know, his, uh, he was being so clever because he was recording me, and you know, ultimately I said to him, uh, you know, Bob, uh, I think you're a liar and a fraud, and I say it on the phone, and I say it in print, so what are you going to do with your recordings, you know? Surely the recordings are only useful if I'm saying something that uh, involves a a catch on your part. In other words, if I'm saying something that I wouldn't put into print, and now you've got me red-handed. But uh, he's one of the sorry. Big... Whatever I say is something I'm willing to write. Rob Balsamo is one of the biggest scumbags I've ever encountered. Oh yeah, he's a bad guy. Uh, I mean, he started this bizarre smear of the producer of Hardfire. Gary Popkin is um, a libertarian activist. He also he was a university professor for many years. He wrote um, an authoritative textbook on uh, COBOL. And Balsamo, or well, one of Balsamo's goons, tried to link him with an ad for an S&M, a gay S&M video. Now, Balsamo, you know, to this day, his his Cretans will will talk about embarrassing me, and I I explained to them, I said, uh, you're kind of missing the point here. Uh, Gary Popkin is a 74-year-old man with a heart condition, has been married for many years, lives close to his grandchildren. No, he's not a crazed gay adventurer who sells spanking caning videos. But if he were, what the hell would that have to do with me? You know, uh, he's, uh, where do I come in the picture? Yes, it's true. I've probably I've hosted ten or eleven of the hundred and fifty or so shows that Gary has done. But I still don't see where I come in the picture. You know, if you could absolutely prove that Gary Popkin has a double life and he sells these reprehensible caning videos, where do I fit in, you know? I mean, what's that got to do with me? Well, there's so much I know about Balsamo, and uh, he lived at a guy's house for a while. Yeah. uh, And I promised I wouldn't say what the guy told me, but I could tell you at least that the guy is a freaking... You want to talk about a freaking loon? There's well, I mean, he, guy he, that's a loon, a, a, a he made death threats somebody. to Mark Roberts, and you know he posts as a woman. <laughs> I mean, this, Tiffany in L.A. Eh, using a picture of uh, some porn girl. Uh, yeah. Calling, oh God, it's just. It's but uh, he's he's just so utterly despicable. But what things people will do for money, I guess, eh? And not much money in his case. Well, you know, I mean, Gage. All right. Seventy grand isn't a fortune, but it's a decent living, and he gets to do a lot of traveling, if you like that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, Balsamo uh, hawking his worthless DVDs for, what, sixteen ninety five. How many do you think he sold? Twenty? <laughs> give the gift of truth for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, give the gift of truth. <laughs> All right, Ron, well, it was a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I'm going to uh, yes, tell you a lot of that information I talked about, and you'll see the sources, especially about Abu Stadter and stuff like that.
Okay. And then maybe right. we could talk again sometime and we can go over some of that stuff. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. Which you, uh, yeah, look, I, I regard you as a friend at this point, so, you know, anytime, feel free to call. Well, thank you very much, Ron. I, I'm Not glad we, uh, <laughs> we, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've evolved our relationship to this point. Listen, all the credit goes to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I, like I said, I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much. All right. All right, you take care. Take care. Bye-bye.